some self-study uh, modules and other resources. He and his wife live in Metro Atlanta um, with their children, Renee, and their um, other children, or his wife, Renee, and his two children, Jack and Piper. I want you to videoscopingly <laughs> welcome Dustin Willis as he presents to us Life on Mission. Hey, I'm Dustin Willis, and hey, I'm Dustin Willis, and I am honored to be with you guys today. I wish I could be there with you in California, especially the weather. It's fantastic out there. I know you guys are having a great time. I am a part of a conference called the Send Conference, and today your conference is beginning, but today our conference is ending. So there was literally no way for me to get there to California for this session, and so I'm grateful for technology that we can do it this way and that I can still be there with you. I'm pumped about your conference and the theme, which is Life on Mission, and being able to share with you a little bit of what God's been teaching me over the last number of years as I've been seeking to live out this concept and idea of life on mission. Uh, a little bit about me, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I work for the North American Mission Board. I'm married. Uh, this is my wife here, just to give you a little context. She was going to come with me. That's actually a picture of us not too far from where you guys are there in California. Um, we were in uh, La Jolla on the coastline there. And then I have two kids, Jack and Piper. Uh, Jack is eight. Uh, he's got a little eye black under his eyes, uh, had a baseball game uh, when this picture was taken. This is my daughter, Piper. She is the life of the party, if you will. Uh, hilarious, keeps us on our toes. So just a little bit about me, my family. I do get to work at the North American Mission Board, but honestly, it's, it is my heart to live out the mission of God right where I'm at. So my family and I, we live in a neighborhood right outside of Atlanta, and on our street alone, uh, we have uh, four different nationalities represented. Um, my wife and I are the only believers uh, on our street. And so I need you to know, yes, I, I, I write books about this stuff and travel and speak and work at a, an organization called the North American Mission Board. But at the end of the day, this really is my heart. This is our family's heart. This is what we live out. This is what we do. We live out the mission, wanting to share the gospel with our neighbors. And so this is our heart. This is what we want to be about. And so I want you to know that this is not just something I go and travel and talk on, but this really is uh, the passion that me, my wife, uh, Carrie, and it's something we're trying to teach our kids even now as they're eight years old and five years old. And the Lord is working. Uh, pray for my neighbors as I'll be praying for you as you seek out to reach your neighbors. Uh, we are seeing God do incredible things, but hoping that Holy Spirit transformation will come and take place in their lives. So what I want to do, this is so different, right? I'm on video. Uh, I'm just in front of a camera doing this, and you're there, I don't know, four or 500, maybe maybe even more of that, of you there, leaders, pastors. Um, I, I want to do something different. We're already, this is already different, so let's just do something different. Let's imagine that right now we're going to get on an airplane, and we're going to, it's dreadful, I know, but we're going to go to LAX, so we've got to deal with the traffic between here and there, but we're going to go to LAX, get on that airplane, all of us together, and we're going to go to a country called Rwanda, Africa. And in Rwanda, what we're going to do is we're going to, let's just say we're going to stay there for four years. So we're not coming back. We're going to stay there for four years. We're going to live out the mission of God. We're going to bring the hope of the gospel, and we're going to meet real needs. So let me give you a little bit of context because here's what you're going to do. In just a few minutes, you're going to break up into groups right there where you're sitting. Again, this is different already on video, so I want to make uh, something a little different for you where you're sitting. And we're going to have a two-minute discussion on what would we do when we get to Rwanda? How would we live out the mission of God? How would we meet real needs? So in Rwanda, uh, the number one cause of death of children is a lack of clean water. Number two cause of death in Rwanda is the HIV, HIV uh, AIDS virus. And so those are two factors that are playing into needs that we can meet. The lack of clean water, uh, somewhere around 30% or so of children there are orphans. So there is incredible need there. So here's the questions I want you to answer as you go into your groups for the next two minutes. Again, just two, three, four people right around you just talking. I'll give you two minutes. We'll put a counter up on the screen. 
And then we'll come back, we'll talk about it a little bit and then get moving into what these implications have on us living out the mission. So knowing Rwanda, knowing that English is not the number one language, knowing that it is a country in great need, they have a lack of clean water, uh, HIV AIDS is spreading and it's a terrible virus that's affecting not only adults, but also children. 34, 30, 30 to 40 percent maybe of the children uh, are orphaned. Many of them are what would be referred to as street kids, meaning they live on the street together just kind of trying to uh, make it work and no real orphanage that they're in. So my question is, what we're getting on this plane, we're going to Rwanda. What are you going to do? Uh, where are you going to live? And how are we going to meet their needs? I mean, can you see it? Can you see that village that we're going to? Can you see the place that we're going? Where are we going to live? How are we going to communicate with them? And ultimately, how are we going to meet real needs and show the love of Jesus? So take two minutes right where you are, just a couple people around you. I want you to talk and interact, and then I'll come back in two minutes, and we'll talk through what some of the potential answers are to those questions. All right, so your two minutes are up. Everybody, if you can, focus back, face this way. And what, what I want to do is, as you're thinking through the answers you just talked about with a few people, uh, I want to maybe take a stab and a guess at some of the things that your groups uh, maybe came up with. Uh, we're going to dig wells. Anybody, by raising a hand, and I, obviously I can't see you, but who said digging of wells? All right, everybody look around, kind of see. Anybody say clean water, like a filtration system? We're going to use a filtration system. Anybody say that while they're lifting their hands? Looking around, all right. Uh, anybody say we're going to build an orphanage? Lifting hands, raising hands, all right. Now, did anybody actually think about where you were going to live? Because maybe what you could do is you build yourself a a, a home that looks like the people there, uh, the, the places that they would live, and the, the way that the architecture looks there, you'd build a place like that. But with that, you'd build uh, a place with that where kids could live. Did anybody go that far in your explanations by lifting hands? We're going to build our own place, but in that, it's going to be a part of the orphanage. We'll live in the orphanage. Do we have anybody in the room uh, that's maybe in the medical field uh, nurses, doctors, EMT, any, anybody in the medical field, okay? That's a great opportunity because we can begin to educate these kids on and adults on HIV, uh, AIDS virus and what that looks like. You might talk about educating children, educating people, okay? Looking around, anybody? All right. Now, we can keep going on this, 
But what I want to tell you is in two minutes, in your groups, you just came up with what the world's leading missionary agencies are doing. Like, in two minutes, we're going to go there, we're going to meet needs, we're going to live where they live, we're going to learn their language, we're going to, they need clean water, we're going to give them clean water. Children need a place to live, we're going to give them a place to live. We're going to dig wells if we need to dig wells. We're going to educate where we need to educate. We're going to love people well. We're going to speak the gospel. We're going to engage this community with the love of Jesus in a very tangible and practical way. And as we do that, speaking the love and truth in the gospel of Jesus. Like you, in two minutes, just came up with that. I love it. I love that. So now, I told you we're going to do something different. Imagine we're going to the LAX airport, which is just stressful to think about, and getting on a plane and going to Rwanda. Now, I want to do something else. I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine your town where you live, where you came from in the last couple of days to be here at this conference. I want you to think about your streets, maybe the street you live on. I want you to think about those neighbors that live right next door. I want you to think about the people that you interact with on a daily basis. Can you see it? Like, have, can you see it? The place that you work, the place that you live. Now, I want to ask you a similar question that I asked you about Rwanda. What are you going to do? How are you going to engage people? How are you going to meet needs? See, I think so often we think about mission and our mind immediately goes to getting on a plane and crossing a body of water and meeting needs and sharing the gospel. And that's correct. That's right. We want to meet needs, share the gospel wherever we go. But my question is, what are you doing right where you are? What does the mission of God look like in the place that you put roots down or that you're putting roots down? I know that my friend Alan Briggs is speaking at the conference. He has a great book called Staying is the New Going, and that's the whole like, heartbeat of his book. What does it look like where you're putting your roots down? So here's my question. What, what are you doing right where you live? And pastors in the room, leaders in the church in the room, how are you leading your people to understand and see their own community as a place to live out the mission of God? How are we having a missionary mindset where we are, in the places that we live, in the streets that we live on, in the apartment complexes that we pay our rent and live with others? What does that look like for you? And pastors, let me say this. You teach people what you know, but you reproduce who you are. You teach people what you know, but you reproduce who you are. So let me ask you this. How are you leading your church to do this by living it yourself in your everyday life? See, I love it. We are saved from sin by the gospel. The fact that Jesus lived the life we could not live, he died the death that we deserved, and he conquered Satan, sin, and death on our behalf. We've been saved. But let me say this. We're not only saved from our sin, we're saved for a mission. And so what does it look like for you in your life to live out that mission in your everyday life where you are, in the crossroads of where you are, in the places that you go, in the people that you see? What does that look like practically? And so I wanna, what I want you to do is grab a Bible, and if you would, go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. We're just going to look at just four verses in that passage, and we're going to break those down practically on what that looks like for you where you are. So we're going to take one passage break it down, and then practically see what the implications are for you and for you as you lead your church. So, Paul in Colossians 4. Hopefully you're there. Colossians 4. And what I want to tell you is this. As we engage in this passage, there is nothing, nothing that is more freeing in your life than abandoning your own mission and joining the everyday mission of God. There is nothing more freeing than abandoning your own mission and joining the everyday mission of God. So, Colossians 4, Paul delivers very clear instruction on what it looks like for us to join God in this everyday mission. So, let's begin to read Colossians chapter 4. It says, Continue steadfastly in prayer 
being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know each, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So in this passage, Paul is giving us this incredible encouragement. He's giving this encouragement to a local church. So let's just break down very quickly what he's saying here. He's saying to pray. He's saying to be thankful. Specifically, he's saying praying, pray for open doors, which by the way is interesting because the man's writing from prison. <laughs> he's praying for open doors, yet he's in a prison. So for us, it's the idea of identifying, identifying and seeing what those open doors are, to share the gospel, to invite people to Christ in a clear way, to be wise with non-Christians, with outsiders, if you will, to, to invest your time with them and to do it wisely, to be gracious in what you say but never being afraid to speak the truth of the gospel in love and give answers to those people with the gospel, which changes people. And God brings, at the end of the day, God brings about the increase. This is what we see in this rich passage from Colossians chapter 4. So you have this incredible church in the city of Colossae, receiving these instructions about sharing the gospel in a clear way with their community. But I want to ask you just a rhetorical question for you to think about where you are. And I think the answer to this question will speak volumes to us as we lead our churches. Who started the church in the city of Colossae? Who started it? Thinking to yourself, who started this church? So I want to go back to just a Flip back in your Bible just a few pages over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope that you, uh, excuse me, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before, get there, before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. This is such good news. What a great way to start a letter. As it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now listen to this. Just as you heard it from Epaphras, our beloved servant. Now, with me, where you're at, just so we're all on the same page here. And you, I have it highlighted on the screen for you. Everybody say Epaphras. All right, let's try it again. Count to three. One, two, three. Okay, Epaphras, you got it, Epaphras. Now, what, what we understand and what we know is Epaphras most likely is the person, scholars would tell us, that started the church in Colossae. But what do we know about him? What do we know about this man named Epaphras? We do know that he has a relationship with Paul, and we do know that there's a good chance that it was Paul that maybe even shared the gospel with him and discipled him in the ways of following Christ. We know that they were together in Rome in uh, AD 57. And so the church in Colossae was started by a guy named Epaphras who was discipled by a man named Paul. But let me ask you another question to think about. Who was it that sent out Paul? And this is all centered on the theme of this conference of life on mission. Who was it that sent out Paul? Flipping your Bibles over to Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, 2 through 3. It says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, 
The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. And we know that Saul in this passage is Paul. For the work to which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them. And what does it say? And sent them off. So, what we find here is the greatest church planting church, the greatest missions sending church in the entire first century here. The most significant sending church in the first century here is the church at Antioch. That's what we find right there in Acts chapter 13. Now, from that local church, we see the spread of the gospel all across the Gentile world. You can even see that in Colossians chapter 1 and right around verse 26 or 27. All over the Gentile world. I mean, this is the church that sent out Paul for crying out loud. Like, I know that maybe you and your churches, and I, I do this within the church I'm a part of, we have these commissioning Sundays. We'll bring missionaries forward and send them out. Like, having Paul as the guy you're sending out is a pretty good commissioning sending Sunday, if you will. It's incredible. Now, let's take this a step further, though. Who started this church? The church at Antioch. What was his name? What was the name of the band that led worship in this church? Here's, here's the answer. We don't know exactly. We don't know the name of the person who planted the church. We don't know the name of those who started this incredible church. And we know churches are started from mission, from making disciples. But who did this? Here's what we know. And I don't have time to go through the whole book of Acts with you right now. But we know by studying the book of Acts that it was not the apostles. It wasn't the big name apostles who had actually been with Jesus, trained with Jesus, been with Him personally. No, the people who started this incredible sending church that sent out Paul were nameless, faithful followers of Jesus. A lot of people say it could have even been farmers. We don't know. So today though, who are those people? Who are those people that are going to live life on mission, make disciples, and start new churches all across the world? Who are those people? Well, today those people are teachers and lawyers and stay-at-home moms and FedEx workers and baristas and engineers and graphic artists and nurses and farmers and CEOs. And the list goes on and on of the people who are sitting in the seats of your churches, the churches that you lead Listen, if, if we're going to see a sustainable, real move of God, a real movement of mission, it will not be because we have better bands. It will not be because we have preachers who are incredibly articulate and dress in such a way that reflects the community. Those things are fine. I'm not against those things. But if we are going to see a real move of mission in our churches, pastors, leaders, it will be on the backs of everyday people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit faithfully joining God's mission to build His kingdom. It will be on the backs of everyday people. I am convinced of that. We need everyday missionaries, kingdom builders in our own communities, living out the mission, seeing the need, looking and going, what are the wells that need to be dug in my own community, if you will? And how can I do that? There is, as you look at the people and the seats around you, but as you also look into the seats of the, and the people that sit in the seats in your own congregations, be reminded there is no such thing as an unsent Christian. We are all sent out to live the mission of God wherever we are. If we have a pulse and we have the Holy Spirit, we're called to live out mission. Listen, the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. But the mission of God has not just been relegated to you as a pastor, relegated to you as a leader in the church. The mission of God has been given to every believer that sits in the seats of your church. So pastors, leaders, empower them, commission them to go. Not just commission them to get in a plane and go overseas. I'm for that. But commission them to go to the neighbor that lives across the street from them. So let me... Let me do this. Let me build this on the screen from you. So from everyday people living out the mission of God, just everyday normal people living out the mission of God, the church at Antioch begins. And from the church at Antioch, 
Paul is then sent out. And then from Paul, he raises up this disciple who we discovered, his name is Epaphras, who then starts a church in the very influential city of Colossae. And then what do we do? We read this encouraging letter. It's what it's the passage we started. It's the four verses we started this whole session with. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So let me say this, pastors. In the same way that Paul writes this letter to Colossae, I pray that the words of this letter are the words that you speak over your churches, are the words that you speak over those everyday mission type folks who are going to live out the gospel where God has planted them. See, living on mission is not always about going to a specific place. It is about being on mission wherever you are. It's a everyday mission. It's everyone living out the everyday mission of God. So how does that practically look? I think like when we think about this, uh, we're encouraged, we're inspired. We want to, yes, I want that. I want to go for that. I want to teach my people that. I want to live that. But how does that practically look? What are, what are the practical things that we can pull and see from this passage in Colossians 4? And for, for that matter, from the life of Jesus, from the way Paul lived, what, what do we see? And when you look at historical and you look at missionaries across the globe and here now in North America, what do we see? What are some of the practicals and values from that passage that we can look at? So I'm going to give you four, okay? Four quick ones. We'll walk through these, be super practical. It'll give you something to take away, to walk away with, something for you to discuss with people during the conference as you guys are walking around from session to session and break out the breakout. But maybe even more valuable, something that you take back to the people that you are leading in the church where you're at. So first value that I want to give you, really simple. Identify. Identify. The idea of identify is identifying the people that need the gospel. So Acts 17. If you want to flip to Acts 17, we're just going to look at a couple of verses there that really uh, give great context and idea for what it means to identify. Identify. Acts 17. All right, verse 26. It says, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Why did God do this? God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him. So it says, if you just look right back in the passage, it says, he determines the time set in the exact places where they should live. So what does that mean? It means you are where you are for a purpose. Like you live by that crazy, annoying neighbor because God cares about that crazy, annoying neighbor. You work in the office next to the person in their office down the way, and you go, gosh, they're so socially awkward. Why do I got to be by the guy who's socially awkward? Because God cares deeply about that person, so he puts you there. He determines the exact places that you should live. And he did it on purpose. God put you there because, you know why? Because Jesus loves your neighbor and he wants you to love your neighbor. He loves the person that sits across the way from you at work because he loves them and he puts you there because he loves them. Because he's put somebody there who has the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that raised Christ from the dead in them. He put you there. The people in your church, the places they live, the sports teams they coach, the clubs that they're a part of, the gyms that they go to, God has placed them there for a time and a purpose, and that is the mission that he's given us. So teach your people, and also let this be true for you. Identify, looking around, seeing people as Jesus sees people. So number one is identify. Number two, invest. 
Invest. Invest your life for sharing the gospel, for living out the mission. If you look in your Bibles in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, it says, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but, now I want you to hear this last phrase, our lives as well. Now, if you were to come into, if you ever come to Atlanta, you want to share a meal, I'd love that. If you come into our home, hanging right there over the couch in our living room, is the phrase, our lives as well. This 1 Thessalonians 2.8 is the very passage that God used to push me at 25 years old to go plant a church. Our lives as well. Not only did we share with you the gospel, but our lives as well. I think so often when we think about mission, we always think addition. I've got to add something to my life. I've got to go to this uh, missions uh, outreach on Saturday. I've got to go to help at this soup kitchen on Tuesday nights. And listen, I'm for all those things. Absolutely, we've got to engage our communities in that way. But so often we think, i got to add something. You think about a adding, it's, it's an addition symbol, right? Just like this. But what if we didn't think of it as just I'm adding something to my life, but what if we began to think of mission as it's two lines that are intersecting? One line being my life with other people and then intersecting the gospel into my everyday life. So here's my question. What do you already do? When we think about investment, we think about, hey, not just adding something to my life, but intersecting the gospel into the rhythms of my everyday walk around life. What do you already do? What are the people in your church that you're leading? What are they already doing? Are they coaching sports teams? Are they... Uh, working out at this gym? Are they a part of a running club? What are people already doing? What are you already doing? What grocery store do you go to consistently? Where do you get your hair cut? Like, we got to begin thinking in this way. People are not just showing up to church anymore. We've got to intersect the idea of church and the gospel into everyday life. Look, we can have our Christian clubs and our Bible studies, and I don't know what part of the country you live in. I know there's some there in Southern California, but uh, we, we, we can't just eat at Chick-fil-A and have Bible studies all the time. Like We have got to move beyond and intersect our lives into the places that people live, work, and play that are not believers in the gospel. And by the way, I love Chick-fil-A. It's incredible Christian chicken. I love it. Hopefully you love it. They have sweet tea at all their stores, no matter where you are, and I'm from the South, so that's a good thing. But here's my point. Look at your everyday life and intersect it with the gospel and with gospel intention. Let me tell you a story. It's it's like a guy named Ryan. Ryan came to me. uh, He was a part of my church, and he came to me, and he said, Dustin, I get it. I'm going to live out the mission of God. How do I do that? Now, often as pastors, we come up with all these different ideas and thoughts, and we encourage our people, and then sometimes they actually take us up on the offers. Hey, I'm going to do it. Ryan was a real estate agent, and uh, he's just one of those matter-of-fact type guys. And so he comes to me, he says, all right, I'll do it. Now tell me what to do. (laughs) And I was like, "Uh, okay, well, what do you already do? Same question I just asked when talking about this idea of investing. What do your people already do? So I asked Ryan, what do you already do? Well, Uh, I'm a real estate agent, I'm single, so I'll drive around our city, and from there, uh, pretty much in the afternoons, towards getting towards evening and dinner time, I go to the grocery store. I I was like, you go to the grocery store every day? He's like, yeah, I go to the grocery store every day. I'm single. So I just go buy what meal I need for that night (laughs) and cook it and then sit by myself. I'm like, sorry. So it, it almost turned into like a counseling session. I was like, okay, so you go to the grocery store. Let's start there. What are the names of the people that work at that grocery store? And he said, "Uh, no idea. Why would I talk to the people at the grocery store? I said, well, that's exactly what you should do. You should engage with them. Just figure out their names. So that's that's your first assignment, Ryan. Go figure out their names. So he comes back and is like, all right, I learned their names. Learned all the names of the people at the grocery store. I was like, okay, now learn some of their stories. All right, I'll go do that. So he goes, Apparently starts learning their stories. And then this time when he came back to me, he said, hey man, I, I learned their, I'm learning all about these people and they're broken, they're hurting. And they've now found out that I'm a believer and they're asking me to pray for them. 
And I said, well, that's incredible. And he went on to tell me, he said, one girl came up to me and said, hey, my mom's going through this uh, deal. And she came up to me and said, hey, will you pray for me? And I told her, yes, I will, I will, I will absolutely pray for you. Because she heard I was the guy that prays for people. <laughs> And so Ryan said, so then she looked at me and said, no, will you pray for me now? And he thought to himself, I have no idea, like, this is awkward. I'm in the grocery store, like, I'm in the produce section, and I'm about to pray for this girl. So he's like, I didn't know what to do. So I just thought, well, I know what you pastors do. So he said, I reached my arm over and put it on her shoulder, and I started praying for her right there, and I said amen. And there was this just joy inside of me that I got to do that. I think it's hilarious. How does pastors do? And so all he knew was that's what pastors do, so I'll just put my hand on the shoulder and pray for it. But God began to work in this local grocery store through a real estate agent named Ryan who just learned their names, learned their stories, and began to pray for people. Now, the story goes on. Uh, Ryan ended up getting uh, sick and uh, ended up being hospitalized for a uh, season. And it was around 40, 40, 41 days that he was in the hospital. Now, I know there's probably some medical staff and nurses in the room. Uh, my wife is a nurse. And so I've been to hospitals a ton of times as a pastor going to visit people, but also visiting my wife. Hospitals have great food, some of them. Some of them have terrible food. The hospital that Ryan was in was a hospital that my wife actually uh, worked at, and they had absolute awful food. Now, here's the cool thing, part of the story with Ryan. Ryan's in the hospital. They're trying to figure out what's going on with him, what's wrong with him. Do you know that he never ate a single meal from that hospital. And the reason why is because every day, three times a day, for 40 days, so 120 meals, never ate one at the hospital. Because every day, three times a day, someone that worked at the local grocery store showed up and said, hey, Ryan, I got your breakfast. Or, hey, Ryan, here's your lunch. And then they would sit and share and eat with him. The people whose names and stories he had learned and been praying for. It's incredible. They ended up, doctors finding out what was wrong with him. He got out of the hospital. And as he got out of the hospital, uh, it was close to Christmas time. And he got this invitation to come to the grocery store staff Christmas party. Now, think about that. The grocery store staff Christmas party. He's not on staff. And so he gets there and he's at the party. And he's like, hey, guys. I'm obviously the only one here who's not on staff at the grocery store. I don't work at the grocery store, but thanks for the invitation. And they looked at him and they said, well, you're kind of on staff. And he's like, well, what do you mean? They said, well, you're the unofficial grocery store pastor. You know, um, if we're going to see a real move of God, we need a lot more unofficial grocery store pastors. And that's what you've got to encourage and empower in your people, that they would not only look at Rwanda, Africa as a place for mission, but they would look at the grocery store as a place for mission. So whether it's a grocery store, a neighborhood, a village in Rwanda, being on mission is not always about going to a specific place as it is being intentional wherever you are. It's about the everyday mission of God. It's about Everyday people abandoning their own mission to join the everyday mission of God. We've got to invest our lives. So, two more points. Number three, invite. Invite people into biblical community. One of my favorite passages is John 13, 35. It says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, I've seen this play out in my own neighborhood, in my own community. We have these huge cookouts, okay, at my house. Now, I don't put the grill in the backyard. I put the grill in the front yard. And I think we got to be more of people who barbecue and uh, grill in our front yards, not our backyards. Uh, the backyard has become this oasis, this place of refuge that we go when we get home. But I believe that the home is one of the most powerful weapons we have to advance the gospel. Biblical hospitality is not an idea, it is a command. So what does it look like for us to open our homes? So we have these huge cookouts, 
And I got a neighbor who's one, two, three houses over. His name's Drew. Drew's kind of the bachelor of our uh, street, if you will. And Drew doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. We're having incredible conversations about it. But one of the things that God has used to work in Drew's life is he sees me interacting with other believers. He sees me talking with other people because what we do is we have these cookouts, we invite non-Christians, we invite Christians, and we grill incredible food. We eat the food and we talk. Now, Drew knows all about cars, like everything you need to know about a car. He has an incredibly nice car. For some reason, it's always broken. Now, I don't think it's technically broken. I think he just breaks it so he has something to work on and to do. Me, I have a car that has 260,000 miles on it, and it's never broken. So I don't understand that, but I think it's just because he loves cars. Like when my car every once in a while does break, you know what I do? I take it to the mechanic, and I ultimately, as some comedians will say, I make sounds to explain what's wrong with my car because I know nothing about cars. But Drew knows everything about cars. So what do I do? I invite my friend Clay to come and be a part of the cookout, him and his wife. Because what does Clay know tons about? He knows tons about two things. He knows a ton about cars, loves cars. Like he breaks his awesome new car all the time just so he can fix it, just like Drew. But he know, you know the second thing he knows about? He knows a lot about the gospel because he loved Jesus, knows about Jesus. Now he's just an accountant, like, but he loves Jesus and he loves cars. And Drew loves cars but doesn't know Jesus. So put some food on the grill in the front yard where all the neighbors can come. And guess what begins to happen? People like Drew begin to talk to people like Clay. And the next thing I know, they're no longer at the cookout. They're in his garage working on his car together. Now they do that all the time. And Clay is sharing the gospel, threaded throughout, intersected in everyday life with Drew. God works in these incredible ways. I like to call it network evangelism. So it's inviting people to your home. It's inviting people to sit at your table and bringing other people around and involved in that. Now, I want to I want to just point a couple things out real quick. It's, the passage says by this everyone. When it says everyone, that circle of everyone represents those who don't know Christ, those who do not have a relationship with Jesus. By this everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Now, I want to show you another word. One another. So, there's these circles that are going on here. You have the circle that says everyone, and then you have the circle that is one another. Now, my question is, is when you look at these two circles, it can become exhausting if you think about the Christian life. And thinking about it is, all right, I got to spend time with it. I got to spend time with everyone. That means I got to live out mission. I got to know my neighbors. I got to share the gospel at least seven times a week because I heard somewhere in some study, if you share the gospel seven times, eventually people respond. <laughs> um, or I got to be a part of three different types of mercy ministry. Or I've got to have non-Christian hospitality nights, only non-Christians, no Christians allowed because I've got to reach everyone. That, that circle, I got to reach everyone, everyone. I can only go on mission trips. I can't go on vacations because I got to reach everyone. I've got to have the four spiritual laws memorized because I got to reach everyone. There's, it's exhausting when you think about it. And so my question is, is where is the space for mission? Now, this concept that I'm about to show you is one that my friend, Alan Briggs, who's speaking at the conference there with you, has actually shared with me. So I'm passing it on to you. It's this idea of it's exhausting to think, I've got to do this. I've got to reach everyone. I've got to reach everyone. But then you look at that other circle because John 13, 35 also points to the idea of one another. And so the idea of one another is, you know, you see throughout the scriptures, uh, in Romans 12, 10, outdo one another. Romans 15, 7, accept one another. And it keeps going on throughout. Serve one another. Carry one another's burdens. Be compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another. Encourage one another. Confess your sins. All these one another, one another, one another. So then it's like, all right, I got to have a Bible study. Uh, I got to have a small group because that's like a cool thing to do with Christians. And then I got to, uh, again, eat at Chick-fil-A and have a Bible study at Chick-fil-A. And uh, I've got to um, uh, just... To spend all my time with Christians. I can only listen to Christian music. I have to throw all my secular CDs into, you know, like a lake or a river or the ocean. Like, it's Christian, 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 Christian. And so you have these two circles, right? And it, this is what we see in John 13, 35. It's everyone. I got to spend time. So it's everyone. Oh, but today is Tuesday. So to, 
Tuesday is when I spend time with Christians, so one another, and it's everyone, one another. It's this idea of mission and Christian community. Mission and Christian community. I mean, how in the world do we do this? It's just, where is the space to live out what we see and we hear? Is this what it's saying, that we got to spend time with Christians over here and non-Christians over here? And No. What if the space was not found by adding something? Because this idea of invite, I'm inviting Christians over, I'm inviting non-Christians. What if the space for us to do it was actually found here? What if it was found here in this space? I believe that it is in this space in the middle that John 13, 35 can truly come alive in our lives and in the people in our churches. I think this is something we have to teach our people because it's by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world, everyone needs to see how we love one another. They need to come to the cookout and see how you interact with your friends and see that it's different and see how we care for each other. Because do mission and community have to be separated? I think we have to teach our churches and I think we have to aggressively fight against the false idea that community happens over in one area of our lives while mission happens and evangelism happens in this other place in our life. Because when this duality exists, the church's effectiveness is diminished severely. Severely. Because it's compartmentalized our lives as disciples. Community and mission are not in competition with each other. They are inseparable. You don't have to choose one or the other. See, non-Christians must see how we love one another. So invite them into Christian community. Invite them into meals at your home. Invite them to be a part They've got to be around Christian community. They've got to be exposed to it because I think it is biblical and we must create space for it because for crying out loud, I'm telling you and I'm seeing it in my own life, in my own neighborhood, it works. We're going to see a move of God. We've got to see this happen in our homes. We've got to see this happen in our neighborhoods and we've got to see it sprinkled out throughout all of the people within our churches. Dr. Todd Engstrom says it this way. He says, the most persuasive argument for the Christian faith is the Christian community. The majority of conversions throughout church history have come not through argumentation, but through belonging to a meaningful community before belief is ever required. So by this, everyone of my disciples, if you love one another. I love what Francis Schaeffer says. He says, our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. So we've got to invite people in. Last point, last idea, we're almost there. Number four, increase. So identify, invest, invite, increase. This is my favorite point because this is the one where all the pressure is off of you. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says this. It says, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. See, this is what God does. If we go to Rwanda, Africa, and we live out the mission of God, if we are going to see any success, if we are going to see any fruit, it is going to be because God, the Holy Spirit, works in the hearts of men, women, and children. If we are going to see a move of God across our communities, our neighborhoods, and our cities, those that are in the shadow of the steeple of your building or your church, if we're going to see a move of God there, it's going to be because we speak the gospel, we, build, we identify, we invest, we invite but ultimately it's going to be because only God brings about the increase. Only God is the one who can rescue a man's soul. So the pressure is off. The pressure is off. So for you, for your people, there is nothing more fulfilling than abandoning your own mission and joining the everyday mission 
of God. So let me land this whole thing with a story. Growing up, uh, I grew up in southeastern part of the United States. My dad uh, did construction and, I mean, just an incredible carpenter was my father. And I wanted to be around him. I wanted to be on the job site. I wanted to go to the place and see what he did and be there. And I, I'll never forget. And he was running a construction crew at this time. And he invited me. Uh, I, was, I think I was about 12 years old and said, hey, I want you to come, Dustin. And I want you to help me out this whole summer. And I was like, this is going to be great. So I show up to the job site and I'm working. I mean, I am working my tail off, sweating. Uh, and I really didn't get to like, you know, use a hammer or nails. It was more of, hey, you go get, I was, a, I, was a, I was a gopher. I just went and got stuff. It was, hey, we need 16 penny nails. I go get the nails. We need a two by four. I went and got the two by four. I just went and got everything that anybody needed. I'd run back and forth, run back and forth. And I'll never forget towards the end of that summer, my dad, my father, who I loved and respected so much, right before we were getting ready to start today, he brought me before the crew and said, hey guys, this is a bunch of blue collar guys. He brought me up and he said, hey, Dustin is going to join the crew today. And I'm thinking to myself, what have I been doing all summer? I thought I was already a part of the crew. And he said, today, Dustin's going to join the crew. And I thought, okay, I don't know what this means. And so then he hands me a nail apron and he hands me this hammer, which by the way, in the South, him handing me that hammer is kind of like being knighted. Like it was like, I am going from boyhood to manhood. I'm a part of this crew now. And it was awesome. And then the next thing he asked me to do, uh, sent nerves to somebody. He said, all right, now get down and nail that floor down. And we were putting down a subfloor and the chalk line was already run. And I said, now? And he said, yeah. So all these men standing around watching, me going down to the floor, me grabbing that hammer and that nail. And you guys don't know me yet and don't know me well. Uh, but if I go for if I'm going to do something, I go for it 100%. So I put that nail down, I take that hammer, and I swing it as hard as I can. Now, you think I hit or miss the nail? I'm not even there, and I know that some of you just under your breath said missed. Thanks a lot for the confidence, but I've got to be honest, you're exactly right. Totally missed the nail. Swung, missed, bruised the floor. Good thing it was a subfloor. But I rear back again, and I come in. Now, I'm not going to ask if, if you thought I hit or missed because none of you have any confidence in me. You don't even know me and you have no confidence. But this next time I swing and I nail it. I hit it. My thumb. And so then my thumb has this awkward heartbeat in it, which is weird. And it's just pulsing. And I'm going, are you kidding me? This is awful. And tears are welling up in my eyes. All these people are watching me and I'm thinking, there's no way that I can do this. There's so much pressure here. And I'm, I just, I'm thinking, dad, I'm not, I can't do this. I'm nervous. There's, and then I swing again, third time. This time I actually hit the nail, but then it's in an S shape, right? You ever done that? It's all crooked. So then I'm over on the side, straightening (laughs) the nail out, trying to get the nail and it's just not working. And I feel ashamed and I'm like, I can't do this. This is not meant for me, dad. (laughs) And my dad comes down and he kneels right beside me and he takes his hand and he puts it right on top of my hand on that hammer. And he says, son, and I still remember the exact words. He, real simple. He said, we can do this. And I thought to myself, I don't know if you've been watching dad, but I don't think we can. (laughs) But nonetheless, he takes and we swing that hammer, his hand on top of my hand and we hit that nail. And amazingly, we hit it exactly as you should. And so it's bam, bam, bam and the nail goes down. And then we move to the next nail. Bam, 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 and the nail goes down. And then I work my way all the way down that chalk line, all the way back up the next one. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? I'm incredible at this. Like, I'm a carpenter. Like, I'll be running the crew soon, guys. Like, this confidence just all of a sudden came over me. I'm like, this is amazing. And I get to the end of the chalk line and I go, oh wait, my dad's hand is still right there on top of my hand. He, he was doing the work. He was doing the heavy lifting. He was making sure that the hammer actually hit the nail. And I think 
that God kind of speaks those same words to you and to those in your church today. We can do this. Look, it is not about you doing the heavy lifting. It is not about you hitting it exactly. It's not about you getting the words exactly right with your neighbor. It's not about your people knowing perfectly how to articulate things. It's about going to work. We get to go to work with our fathers. And he's not looking for us to do anything miraculous. What he's looking for is for us to put our hand on the hammer. And then he makes it happen. I want in on that mission because he's the one that brings about the increase. He's the one that makes it actually work. So identify, invest, invite, and then let's watch God do work as he brings about the increase because I promise you there is nothing more fulfilling than abandoning your own mission and joining the everyday mission of God. Whether you're in Rwanda, Africa, or whether you're in Ohio, or Indiana, or Nevada, or California, or Atlanta, where I am, God the Holy Spirit is on a mission, and he's asking us to join him in that mission. And so what I want to do to conclude our time is there is a lady by the name of Karen Watson who has influenced me in the way of mission almost as powerful or strongly than anyone I know. Her story is inspiring to me. It is encouraging to me. And her story has impacted and changed the way and my motivation for the mission that we live on. Because we don't live out mission from a place of guilt. We live out mission from a place of understanding that it is about the glory of God. Now, the interesting thing about Karen Watson and how she's encouraged and inspired me is she's a person I've never met. And so I want you to meet her through her story as we conclude this session. So you guys check out the story of Karen Watson. Karen was a member of our church. She took a number of short-term mission trips. And it was while she was taking those short-term mission trips that she realized that she wanted to do more. This was right at the beginning of the conflict in the Middle East in 2003. Karen's background was in security. She was uh, Kern County Sheriff's Department. So when she applied to the International Mission Board, they realized that she had a unique skill set. And uh, so they offered her an opportunity to go to Iraq uh, right after the invasion and help with uh, a security 